Dr. Matthew Wood, uh, talking about from Oxford University, talking about uh, trans brain blood barrier uh, exosome. Um, thank you very much, uh, especially to Aubrey, for the invitation to come and talk to you and tell you a little bit about some of our new work. Um, as you can see from the title, I'm going to be talking to you about um, interesting particles called exosomes for delivering drugs to the brain. Um, and uh, this is really a new discovery uh, in my lab over the last year or two. Um, actually, what my, my lab is really mainly focused on is a, it's an RNA biology lab. We, we do RNA biology and we develop RNA types of therapies. Um, and this slide here really gives you a snapshot of some of the key moments in the history of RNA, which you can see go back uh, pretty much 150 years. Um, I could point to any of these as key moments in, in the, the history of RNA, but I think in terms of therapy, there are, there are a couple of, of key moments. Um, uh, about 30 years ago, when pre-mRNA splicing was discovered by a number of labs, including the Sharp Lab in the US, uh, this really gave us insights into how RNA was processed. Um, and this is actually a major focus of my lab, where we're developing therapies for muscular dystrophy, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, myotonic dystrophy, which all involve modulation of splicing uh, to restore uh, the expression of correct proteins. And I'm not going to tell you anything about this, this work today. Um, but probably one of the most recent discoveries uh, in the RNA field that has really uh, been very, very important in terms of therapeutics is the discovery pretty much a decade ago, just over, of, of gene silencing by the mechanism of RNA interference uh, by, by Andrew Fire and Craig Mello, which won them the Nobel Prize not, not so long ago. And uh, this mechanism of switching off genes has enormous therapeutic potential. Uh, I think everyone in the field would agree today that the major hurdle in, in realizing that potential is how you deliver these RNA interfering molecules to the correct target cells uh, within complex organisms. And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so their discovery, which, uh, uh, as I said, was about a year, uh, a decade ago, this is Andrew Fire, Craig Mello, uh, followed on work earlier, uh, which uh, identified some of the key substrates involved in RNA gene silencing, which was actually work done by, uh, by plant biologists. And you can see some of these interesting images here where genes have been switched off or silenced uh, in, in, in petunia plants. Um, for those of you who don't really know much about gene silencing at all, I'm, I'm taking that might be some of you, uh, I'm just going to give you this very simple cartoon to explain the, the biochemistry uh, behind gene silencing. The critical uh, gene silencing compounds are small, double-stranded pieces of RNA. Uh, this is an example of one of these, a small interfering RNA, which are about 21 to 22 nucleotides in length. They're typically asymmetrical, not as I've shown in this very simple cartoon here. And typically what happens is that one of these strands of RNA is the active strand. Uh, these two strands unwind. The active strand becomes incorporated into a protein complex uh, containing other critical proteins, particularly those of the argonaut family, which guide this uh, guide strand towards a messenger RNA target sequence to which it base players by a, a, a sequence homology. Uh, and this results typically with uh, a high degree of complementarity here in the cleavage of the target messenger RNA. And these products are subsequently degraded. And this is how gene silencing takes place. Um, there are natural methods of gene silencing in our own cells, which utilize uh, RNAs or non-coding RNAs called microRNAs. But essentially, if you want to utilize this technology as a therapeutic tool, you have to be able to deliver something like a small interfering RNA to target cells. There are a variety of ways of doing this. There are expression methods whereby one might express it uh, within the cells. But essentially, the most efficient way would be to de develop or deliver these chemically synthesized small double-stranded RNAs to cells. And of course, these are much larger molecules than, than, than typical small molecule drugs, probably of the order of 10 to 100-fold higher molecular weights, um, and they're not going to be easily delivered to cells or tissues. They're certainly not going to be easily delivered to the brain. Um, now, a number of the strategies for the systemic delivery of RNA to the brain, in other words, across the blood-brain barrier via intravenous or other systemic routes, have involved these kinds of methods either lipid-based, 
nanoparticle types of delivery reagents, uh, a study that I'll refer to in a second that uh, utilizes peptide-based uh, uh, complexation methods to form peptide-based nanoparticles or polymers that might uh, give you delivery across the blood-brain barrier. And of course, there are a range of natural biological vehicles um, that people have been utilizing without very much success, particularly viruses, but other types of, uh, of you know, biological vehicles that could be considered for delivery. But to date, or up until very recently, most of these methods have been very, very, very inefficient at delivery across an intact blood-brain barrier. Uh, and so here is really a, a simplistic cartoon of that blood-brain barrier. I don't really propose to go into the, into the details. I think everyone is aware of the fact that this is a major barrier to the delivery of a large macromolecular drugs into the nervous system, an intact blood-brain barrier. And I think one of the reasons uh, why is not simply because this barrier is intact. It's because we probably don't really understand many of the factors that actually regulate the intactness of this barrier. Uh, and I think as someone uh, like myself who doesn't really study the blood-brain barrier in great detail, um, this was really brought home to me last year. I think many of you might have seen, I think, three papers that came out, two in Nature, one in Neuron, that described the really fundamentally crucial role of these cells called pericytes in maintaining and regulating the blood-brain barrier. And, of course, we didn't really have a good understanding of this un until 2010, last year. So I think our understanding of what regulates the integrity of this barrier in health and disease is lacking. And this is probably something that's going to be very important as we go forward in terms of developing uh, trans blood-brain barrier delivery methods. So this is a major barrier to the delivery of large molecules such as RNA, uh, peptides, proteins, um, to, to a healthy brain or to an intact, across an intact blood-brain barrier. So one of the interesting studies which certainly got uh, my lab's interest a few years ago when, when we reviewed this paper um, uh, utilized a peptide-based delivery system. And this was published in Nature in 2007 from a group um, mainly based in Boston. Um, and what they utilized uh, for transvascular delivery to the brain was a peptide. Uh, uh, an arginine-rich peptide, also coupled to a rabies virus peptide, where they complexed this peptide with small interfering RNA and were able to show in their, in their data that they got delivery of this small interfering RNA to the brain and the silencing of a reporter gene in the brain. Um, I think some of the details are in this abstract. Uh, I'm aware of uh, probably at least half a dozen labs, and there are many more that have tried to replicate this work and had failed, but it certainly provoked a lot of interest at the time. Um, and there's no really good understanding as to why this has proved to be so difficult to replicate. Um, but it was a very, very interesting study, and one of the things that came up was the use of, of this rabies virus glycoprotein peptide uh, as a possible way of delivering structures across the blood-brain barrier. So soon after this paper was published, uh, my group got interested in ways of trying to deliver RNA to the brain, uh, and mainly because some of the other diseases that, are, that I've referred to that we're working on, such as uh, uh, muscular dystrophy, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, myotonic dystrophy, uh, actually have neurological components to them. And so ultimately, although we're focused on treating the muscle aspects of those disease, uh, diseases, ultimately we will need to treat the neurological components of those diseases if we're going to treat the patients completely. So, so we are, or have been interested in delivery to the brain for some time. Now, just to take you again back to the original discovery of RNA interference, um, many of these early studies were actually done in the worm. And, and the worm is very interesting uh, in terms of RNA biology because you can deliver double-stranded RNA to the worm uh, by feeding the worms on RNA. And the RNA is able to be taken up from the gut, and it is uh, transported, if you like, systemically throughout the worm. So you can actually silence genes throughout the worm by oral gastrointestinal delivery to the worm. So the worms have got a very efficient uh, system, intrinsic system, for the systemic spread of RNA around the worm. Um, and this has also struck us as interesting some time ago because we'd wondered whether there was such a similar system for systemic spread of RNA uh, in mammals or in humans. Uh, and a paper published about the same time as that other Nature paper I had on the screen was this paper, also published towards the end of 2007, uh, by some, some now uh, colleagues and collaborators of ours from Jan Lotfeld's lab in uh, Gothenburg in Sweden, described just such a mammalian system for the transport of nucleic acids and RNA around the body systemically. And this was based on vesicles known as exosomes. So here is a, an EM image of an exosome. These are naturally occurring nanoparticles. They're secreted vesicles, secreted from most cells, 
And this was an absolutely beautiful paper where they showed that these vesicles contained RNA, they contained messenger RNA, they contained microRNA, and that these RNAs could be transported between cells in the exosomes. In their paper, um, he's a respiratory physician, so they study mast cells. Um, in their paper, they showed that these RNAs could be transported between populations of mast cells, that mRNAs could be transported, and they were competent for translation in recipient cells, that microRNAs were transported, and they could downregulate host transcripts in recipient cells. These RNAs were transported and functional when they were transported around the body. And this really gave us the idea that we could potentially utilize this natural system of natural exosome nanoparticles for the delivery of RNA um, to the nervous system. And we set out probably now uh, three, three and a half years ago to try and test this idea to see whether it was possible. And at the time, it was a very small project in the lab whilst everyone else was working on treating muscle diseases. Um, now, exosomes are very interesting uh, vesicles because there are a range of different types of vesicles that are released from cells, from larger vesicles, which are sort of micro-sized vesicles, to these exosomes, which are nano-sized vesicles. But they originate from multivesicular bodies. Uh, through the inward budding of the multivesicular body membrane and ultimately the re release of these vesicles. And so if you then look at some of the different uh, properties of these cellular vesicles, you'll see exosomes compared with microvesicles and exosomes, etc. This is roughly the size in the nano range. They've got a very enriched and, and rather specific type of lipid composition, uh, a very unique uh, proteomic uh, repertoire and composition. But the key difference between the exosomes and all of these other vesicles is that these vesicles arise from endosomes, from internal membrane compartments within the cells, whereas all of these others appear to be buddings of the plasma membrane. So they have a very different biogenesis and origin. Um, and so the task that uh, we set out to try and um, accomplish was whether we could um, uh, put rather simplistically and schematically here, was whether we could isolate exosomes, shown here, was whether we could develop the methods for inserting RNAs into them, in other words, to be able to deliver something like an siRNA. And beyond that, we were also interested in ways that we might be able to alter the protein expression on the exosome membrane to target the delivery of exosomes to particular types of tissues. We had uh, theorized that this might be possible given the and the proteomic repertoire are natural exosomes because these exosomes probably traffic between tissues naturally. So we thought we might be able to influence that by the insertion of proteins into the exosome membrane itself. And this was the little model system that we'd set up when we started out in these experiments. The idea originally was that we were going to take uh, bone marrow from, from, from normal mice, isolate uh, 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 dendritic cells, primary dendritic cells from bone, from, from bone marrow, um, we were then going to develop uh, methods for uh, isolating exosomes from these cells, for, larded, for loading different types of cargos into the exosomes, and ultimately we're going to put the, the loaded exosomes back into the mice to see if we could deliver these cargos systemically. As I say, as we went through this, we then introduced a step where we were trying to modify the exosomes recombinantly in order to express peptides or proteins on the exosome surface to influence the targeting or the trafficking of the exosomes. But this was essentially the little schematic system that we set out to test. Um, surprisingly, in our hands, uh, isolating the, the exosomes uh, and characterizing these routinely was, was the most difficult step. Um, we went for dendritic cell-derived exosomes because actually, although exosomes haven't been studied for, for that long, they were originally described in the late 1980s, They've been worked on by, mainly by immunologists, and actually the methods for producing them from immune cells, such as B cells and dendritic cells, were very, very well established. And so that's why we originally decided to use primary dendritic cells as the source of exosomes. Um, but this actually proved to be a very difficult step for us, and we, it took some time until we were getting really homogeneous populations of exosomes that we were able to characterize uh, in terms of their protein expression to be absolutely confident that these were uh, exosome vesicles that we were working with. Um, the step where we altered uh, recombinantly the expression of proteins on the exosomes, we decided to do as follows. Uh, a very highly enriched exosome protein is a protein known as LAMP2B. And what we decided to do was to insert peptides in the extracellular domain of LAMP2B that we thought may have targeting or trafficking properties. Uh, so in other words, to insert these little peptide ligands into the extracellular, extracellular domain of LAMP2B. We've done this for, for many peptides now, but 
Uh, two of the early ones that we studied were, were one that we'd worked on before for muscle. This is called muscle-specific protein. Uh, it's a heptamer, uh, binds a muscle, muscle ligand, and um, is, is competent for delivery of, of cargoes to muscle. The other more interesting one, though, for, for today's talk, really, is this rabies virus glycoprotein, a short 28 amino acid sequence divide, derived from rabies virus, binds acetylcholine receptors, uh, and is, is really competent for delivery uh, or binding and internalization of cargoes into, into neurons and other cells that express acetylcholine receptors. Um, so this actually proved to be relatively easy to do. Uh, and then we had to develop methods for inserting cargoes into these exosomes. And I should say, at each of these steps, we had to then go back and validate and characterize our exosomes to ensure that what we'd done to them hadn't altered their, their biophysical properties, uh, their molecular properties. Um, so each step was, was accompanied by, by you know, electron microscopy and rechecking uh, the integrity of the exosomes that we were working with. But actually inserting cargoes into the exosomes proved to be a lot easier than we'd anticipated. We thought this was going to be the most difficult step. Uh, actually, it turned out to be relatively easy. So we now have a number of methods for inserting RNA cargoes into exosomes. We can use electroporation, modified transfection protocols. And we're developing some new methods which are based on transfecting the parent cells and harvesting the exosomes from those cells already preloaded with RNA. And that turns out to be possible as well. But in the experiments I'm showing you today, the methods we'd use were simply based on electroporation of the RNA into the exosomes. So here's just a, a tiny bit of data um, uh, just showing that we can uh, recombinantly alter the protein expression on the rep exosome surface. Um, uh, these are exosomes here expressing uh, the, the MSP, uh, muscle-specific peptide. These are QRT-PCR assays and other populations of exosomes enriched for the RVG. Um, this turned out to be very easy, and we got very high levels of expression of both of these ligands on the exosome surface. Um, there was potentially a possibility, a, a theoretical possibility, uh, um, that the topology of the LAMP2B proteins could have put these ligands on the inside of the exosome rather than, than on the outside. So we had to develop a series of pull-down assays to, to absolutely prove that these ligands were on the external face of the exosomes and not internally expressed, uh, which fortunately they were. Um, and and then to get to, to the details of, of, of the brain delivery, um, our, our initial experiments were exactly as I've outlined here. We took wild-type normal mice. Uh, we took exosomes loaded with 150 micrograms of siRNA targeting a reporter gene in the brain, GAP-DH, a reporter gene. And we injected these via the tail vein, as I said, in normal mice. And two hours, and, you know, really, Astonishment. This is pretty much the data we got in our first experiment, with really very, very striking silencing of this GAP-DH gene uh, to 50% or more in several brain regions, uh, not in the tissues that you would expect uh, uh, in the mouse uh, via tail vein delivery, because you would normally expect to see gene silencing in the liver and the spleen. And sorry, I should have said these were the exosomes expressing the rabies virus glycoprotein. I'm just showing you the data for those at the moment. Interestingly, we saw some gene silencing in the kidney, uh, and this has turned out to be reproducible. Not as significant as we see in the brain, but this appears always to be present whenever we do these experiments. And um, there is some acetylcholine receptor expression in parts of the kidney, and this may be an explanation, at least in part, for some of the, the data we see. But the tissues that should have been affected really via tail vein delivery, the liver and the spleen were completely clean, and we saw knockdown of gene expression in the brain. How long after the injection? Uh, this is an injection uh, given 10 days before we've analyzed the tissues in the brain. Down below are mice, mice that have now received two injections, so a, an injection on day one, on day three, and then we've analyzed again on day 10, and we get much tighter uh, error bars and, and very nice knockdown of this reported gene um, 10 days later in the brain. Now, um, GAP-DH is actually not a very interesting gene if you're interested in therapy. Um, but we looked at the levels of GAP-DH protein, and you can see here in the treated, the RVG-treated brains, the levels are probably a little bit lower. They're about 10% lower, but they're not significantly lower. Um, and so we, we wondered really why that was, but we didn't spend too much time on that because we weren't really interested in, in GAP-DH. Um, and we were interested really in essentially the diseases of brain aging, uh, and the first scenario that we looked at in the lab was really uh, an Alzheimer's disease paradigm, if you like. But we looked at this in normal mice. So I think many of you will be very familiar with this little schematic. Uh, 
for how the amyloid precursor protein is, is degraded to generate A beta peptides. And two of the critical enzymes that are involved in that are beta and gamma secretase. Um, these uh, are, are really major uh, drug targets for drug companies in terms of trying to develop uh, inhibitors of these secretases. And this has proved to be extremely difficult for a number of reasons, not just generating <coughs> inhibitors with the required specificity, but also ultimately delivering these to the nervous system is, is not straightforward. Um, and our intention originally was to look at whether we could inhibit one of these secretases, beta secretase, using a gene silencing method. So instead of using a pharmacological method, could we knock down the expression of beta secretase in the mouse cortex uh, using RNA interference methods? Um, we uh, designed and validated a whole series of, of siRNAs working with our collaborators uh, at Novartis in Switzerland and um, tested a whole series of sequences, optimized the RNA sequences so that they worked very well in vitro, and then used exactly the same experimental paradigm that I'd shown you previously, where siRNAs were loaded into RVG uh, pseudotyped exosomes, delivered at 150 micrograms total RNA uh, via tailbone injections, again into to normal wild-type mice. And, and this was exactly the kind of data we, we saw in the early experiments. Strikingly good silencing of the base one beta secretase gene by up to 70%. And this is, this is really unprecedented. I think even the people who are doing viral delivery studies where they inject the viruses to directly into the brain do not see gene silencing typically of levels of 70%. So this was, this was really very, very surprising. But in, with base one this time, when we looked at Westerns and looked at the protein levels, we were getting pretty good knockdown of the base one uh, base one protein as well, probably at levels of 40 or 50 percent. And so we then went back uh, and repeated these experiments in great detail. I'm not going to bore you with the detail and the, the many, many, many controls that we had to use um, uh, to really be confident that we were getting extremely good data. But this was very, very reproducible in terms of the QRT-PCR RT -PCR assays, uh, silencing of base one, 40 to 50 percent, 60 percent knockdown, down to 40 percent of normal. Uh, protein levels equally down by about 60%. And this is after a single injection and looking at mouse cortex 10 days later. We were obviously also very interested in whether uh, knocking down beta secretase had any impact on the levels of A beta 1 to 42 that we could measure in, in mouse cortex. Uh, and so we set out uh, using ELISA assays to, to assay the concentration of A beta 1 to 42. And we found a statistically significant decrease to about 50%. Uh, of normal levels in these normal brains. Uh, so I should reiterate, these are absolutely normal mice um, in terms of the knockdown of, of uh, or the effective reduction of A beta 1 to 42. So we'd shown very convincingly that we could deliver the RNA to the brain. Um, uh, there is data that I'm, I'm not showing you today that was in the supplementary data when this was published. This is showing you uh, localization of the siRNAs using labeled siRNAs. We were able to show that. Uh, co-localized with neurons and co-localized with <laughs> oligodendrocytes in brain. So we know the siRNA has got into the brain very efficiently, and we know the results of this in terms of getting very, very efficient RNA gene silencing in the brain. Uh, so this work was published earlier this year. It had an awful lot of mostly very favorable publicity. Um, and um, I wanted to take one slide now just to try and put this into perspective, because I think this has enormous potential, but it's going to take a long time to realize that potential, and there's some major, some major challenges. If this really is uh, to be a new type of drug delivery system for, for macromolecular drugs, uh, it's going to take a significant amount of time and investment to develop it. So one of the, one of the fundamental questions that we, uh, that we didn't address in our paper that, we, that we're currently addressing is how these exosomes actually trans traverse the blood-brain barrier itself. Um, so working with colleagues at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, we've been able to show that the uh, blood-brain barrier endothelial cells in our mice actually do express levels of the acetylcholine receptor, uh, the alpha subunit, which is the one to which the, the RVG peptide binds. So there is a plausible explanation that we do get binding and internalization of our exosomes at the blood-brain barrier endothelial cells. And it's some transcytotic process. We're in the process of completing these studies that might mediate transfer of the exosomes and their cargoes across an intact blood-brain barrier to the nervous system. We've shown siRNAs, as I've said to you, the siRNAs being localized in, in the neurons in the cortex, so we know they get there. But mechanistically, exactly how they get from, from the blood across that uh, endothelial barrier and into the neurons is, is still something that, that we're working on. 
Um, but we hope actually by understanding this in more detail, we'll have uh, ways uh, that we can think of even improving this technology further. One of the very big questions for the, for the future work uh, is really how we improve these exosomes. What are the optimal exosomes? I don't think dendritic cell-derived exosomes are going to be optimal uh, for brain delivery. Um, potentially exosomes derived from a brain origin cell, brain stem cell. Um, but ultimately, in point four down here, can humanized be exos exosomes be developed for, for disease therapy? So we're working with a, a company called Lonza to do this uh, currently. Um, Stem cell derived exosomes are almost certainly going to be the, the, the source that we would need to, to develop uh, for, for clinical and human applications. Um, and so we're now embarking on a program to investigate a whole range of stem cell derived exosome populations to see whether these are likely to be useful. One of the other questions really is how broad could this technology be in terms of delivery? Is it just useful for delivering RNA or might it be useful for other things as well? Well, we, the data I've shown you is for double stranded RNA. We work in the lab with oligonucleotides, and so we've been able to show that we can load single-stranded oligonucleotides very efficiently. We can load DNA slightly less efficiently, uh, and we can also load peptides. We're trying to now work on methods for loading larger proteins uh, and including antibodies into these, into these vesicles. So potentially, uh, the range of biotherapeutic molecules that could be delivered uh, might be even broader than certainly RNA. And so the summary, really, of what I've shown you is that these naturally occurring nanovesicles known as exosomes are really competent for the delivery of large biological macromolecules across an intact blood-brain barrier to the nervous system. And they could really be uh, a very important application in age-related neurodegenerative diseases. And they really have a potential, but at this stage only a potential, to form a very new class of disease-modifying uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, if I can just acknowledge a few of the people who've been involved in this work. The, the origins of this work really originated with a, a really brilliant uh, postdoc, uh, Lydia Alvarez, a Spanish postdoc working in my lab, uh, and, an, and an A-star graduate student from Singapore, Ichi Sao, who's now back with his own lab in Singapore. Uh, together they really developed the system in my lab. I'm working with colleagues, a number of colleagues, but mainly with David Morrissey at Novartis, who've provided a lot of the funding support for this work, along with these funding agencies. Thank you very much. This paper is now open for questions. Uh, please keep in mind that we still have another talk. It's a short talk. So, uh, just a couple of Hello, very nice talk. Anytime you develop an inhibitor against an enzyme, you have to worry about how many pathways is that enzyme involved in. Uh, and I, I, I know there's several companies trying to find or yeah. design base inhibitors that only block base's ability yeah. to act on APP. Um, are you taking that into consideration, and is, is BASE truly a single pathway that will allow this to be done safely? Um, I mean, I, I, I haven't really been able to tell you about a lot of the work that's in progress currently in some of the future work we've got planned. We, we, we're pursuing BASE-1 as a potential target, but I, I'm not, I think your skepticism is probably, probably right. I think it's actually quite a complex target to think about uh, therapeutically. Um, I mean, one of the major models we're working on at the moment is the one that David talked about at the, at the, at the beginning of this session on a Huntington's disease model. We're working with exactly the same collaborators, David is, Roger Barkey here in Cambridge, and also on Parkinson's disease. Uh, but um, uh, the base one is something we're pursuing with collaborators at Novartis, but uh, I think it, it's, a, it's a challenging target for, for a number of reasons. Uh, two uh, questions, beautiful talk. Uh, do the exosomes interact with the lipoprotein system and LDL receptors? Point one, point two. <laughs> um, ten days after a single delivery seems a remarkable length of time given the turnover of GAP-DH, which I believe is five days half-life. Mm. Um, these, um, um, the first question is, the, uh, the answer is I don't know. Uh, I think it's highly likely that there is some interaction with the LDL receptor system. Um, there are, there are, uh, I think that there's um, a new website uh, that's been curated by some uh, Australian scientists at, uh, at the University of Melbourne called Exocarta, which is really a huge proteomic resource for uh, proteomic data on exosomes. And I think there is certainly the very likelihood that there are exosome-related proteins that, in, that interact with the LDL system. Um, uh, the second point, um, we were using stabilized siRNAs that um, have, uh, so these are not unmodified siRNAs, they're chemically stabilized, so they have longer half-lives, um, 
and potentially a stable, certainly in serum, for, for, for 72, 96 hours. So I think that's part of the explanation for why we were seeing data that uh, gave us good knockdown of target genes up to 10 days after delivery. Any future ideas about specifically designing your exosomes to target a cell type, like glutamatergic neur neurons or dopaminergic neurons? Um, we, we're working on targeting dopaminergic neurons, I'm, and uh, if I can remember, I can tell you the peptide we're using. They're, they're, I, I just can't remember. Uh, um, there was a paper published, I think, about a year ago in the think, Journal of Neurochemistry that identified a peptide that might be related to or target uh, uh, a dopaminergic receptor, um, dopaminergic surface protein. Um, I just can't remember what it is. So we're currently cloning this one in and testing it out. I don't know if it's going to work, but that, that there is one that seems to be dopamine specific. Thank you, Dr. Wood. And I'm sure that there's more questions, but you can contact Dr. Wood after this session. And we have to move forward to the next uh, short. <laughs>